Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it really, really helps us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And thank you so, so much to anyone that's already done that for us. You are an absolute legend to us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? Very well, Mark. Good to be here again. Good to see you. I am still here in lockdown cupboard, slightly renovated, as I mentioned last week. It feels like about day 900 of this new lockdown to me already. <laughs> How are you feeling? Yeah, it's been a pretty rough time recently, hasn't it? It's not been not been great. <laughs> not been great at all. And just with the weather drawing and, and the nights coming in earlier here in Glasgow, yeah, it's a bit harder than the first time around, I think. But, you know, video games are going to help with that. Video games are going to help with that loss. So what have you been playing? Well, I've still been making my way through uh, Hollow Knight. If you'll excuse the terrible pun, I'm starting to get the bug for it, Mark. I think I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting yes. to feel what it is that, you know, the, the noises people make when they talk about this game and how excited and how passionate people are about it. As I've been saying over the last Last few weeks i've been struggling with elements of it i find the the time sink that it sort of demands by the dint of its whole design philosophy to be quite taxing and, and quite challenging for me but i'm now at a point i've just reached the crystal peak i'm in that zone but i kind of feel like i'm getting to grips with it progress is a, a bit steadier and a bit more regular and not as time consuming as it has been up till now i'm managing to take down bosses in fewer attempts and there was just one section that i stopped on last night that was quite a tricky bit of platforming that just took me right back to celeste and i just suddenly was like oh yeah i can do this and as tricky as these things are i've, I've beaten games that are as hard as this and that is a a good reason and a good encouragement to keep going with it i think so that's how my hollow night playthrough is going i've still got miles and miles to go i think probably about two-thirds of the game so i'm sure next week i'll be telling you that it's kicking my arse again <laughs> nice one man this is great this is this is very very good to hear that you finally got over the initial hump of being incredibly difficult and now you are comfortable with what you're supposed to be doing your knight himself will be getting stronger you will be getting better at the game and i think in games like this there is an initial hump to get over quite a lot of the time and the initial portions of a lot of these games can be extremely punishing however once you get over that initial hump you can really start to see the game for how truly truly fantastic that it is so i'm very very glad that you are now at least starting to see why i love it so much you know yeah i mean don't get me wrong plenty of sections before this I, i've really enjoyed and i've got to say and i think i've said it several times already like the look and the feel of the game is just incredible it's got this beautiful kind of animated style that every time you enter a new section it's it's just remarkable and it's just that now i'm finally starting to feel that on the gameplay side as well that as difficult as it is as it can be there's a real reward in getting through that and there's sections and bosses and enemy types that i've come up against that i've been like yes this was as hard as it's been this is good fun and i can't wait to see what the next bit of the game is going to throw at me awesome man that's really really cool very very glad to hear it and during one of my necessary hollow knight breaks i did make a, a very small start to another game which i've been meaning to play for a while now which is desperados 3 nice which is a, a series of games i know nothing about basically but saw a lot of buzz around the new installment which came out just a few months ago this is like a real-time strategy game where you a stealth strategy game i should say where you basically control from an isometric perspective a slew of different characters all with different abilities effectively all you're trying to do is stealth your way through these environments and knock off certain enemies I'm only a, about an hour or two into the game it's got a lengthy tutorial because there's a hell of a lot going on under the hood in this game but so far I've been finding it really really interesting as a lot of these games tend to be for me it sets itself out like a series of puzzle rooms basically and that you are in this kind of environment just working out the best order to go around things the best ways to drag people out of position and then move your team into the right positions it's all set in this kind of slightly goofy cowboy western world i have no idea what the plot is or if the plot really connects to the other games yet because it just kind of starts and doesn't really give you much to go on but it's really scratching that XCOM itch that i was very well scratching earlier this year with chimera squad which i played for weeks on end and i just realized that that 
type of game for me is a real relaxant like just having the ability to sit and watch patterns on the screen and understand what the right move to make is and it uses this autosave function where it encourages you it actively puts a timer up on the screen to tell you when your last save was if it's been more than a minute and you basically i'm playing on ps4 you just keep bashing the touchpad and it auto saves the game the whole game is built around the idea that failure is part of it and that you should be trying things out to see how they work to see how different enemies will react and move you basically just hit l1 and it begins again you just start your loop again and you try and find the right way through so i think there's hours and hours of fun for me ahead in this game i'm really looking forward to getting stuck (laughs) in more but i am going to try and keep it for those moments where i'm just like hollow knight's not the right thing right now you know so late at night if i just want a quick hour of gameplay or if i'm stuck at a boss and i just need a a wee break that's what i'm going to turn to Nice one, man. That sounds really, really good. I had no idea throughout our entire history of gaming together, Lewis, that you loved RTS games so much. And I just don't understand why you just don't go and play XCOM 2, which is the daddy of all <laughs> RTS games. Well, I did. I played a lot of that, or a decent chunk of it, at least. But I didn't really realise either. I've had this kind of awakening to them recently, so uh, maybe I have to go back, yeah. And what about you, Mark? What have you been playing? Well, Lewis, it's more Bloodborne, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. more Bloodborne. I have now basically beat the whole game apart from the final boss. And the reason why I have not beat the final boss is because I decided to go and play all of the DLC, which I had to buy separately. And I've subsequently decided to go for the Platinum Trophy as well because I've beat every single boss in the game apart from one other one and the final boss. However, I said to you that I was going to go for this Platinum and I've had maybe four gameplay sessions since then and I've still not managed to reach this other final boss (laughs) because she resides in what are called the Chalice Dungeons, which absolutely suck. They are the fucking worst. Remember last week when I was saying that I absolutely loved the level design of this game? I loved it so, so much and it is incredible. And the DLC, again, is just absolutely top quality level design. It is superb absolutely superb but if you wanted to know what this game would be like with absolutely shocking level design then go into the chalice dungeons because they were obviously designed when miyazaki was on holiday or something (laughs) they are really really bad they are supposed to be or they can be at least semi-randomized and i think that that is where a lot of the problems come in but the ones that i'm playing through are set so i don't understand why they're not designed better because they still feel randomized even though they're not Mm. which isn't great you no, know it doesn't sound great no it's it's not and going through all these dungeons is actually incredibly incredibly difficult which i hadn't realized before i was going for the platinum trophy so it's now taken me four gameplay sessions to get to the second to last dungeon that i have to complete before getting on to this final boss it's taken a long time mate it's taken a real long time <laughs> But I'm still massively enjoying the game. The game, in actual fact, is an absolute masterpiece. It really is. I was thinking about this the other day, and I basically have no complaints about the game at all. Like, I have nothing really bad to say. It kind of reminded me about the feeling that I had when I finished God of War, and that when it was finished, I just thought, that was brilliant, and I have really no complaints about this in the slightest. I've been stunned at how much I've grown to love the game, to be completely honest, man. Nice one, man. I am stunned as well. Not because I didn't think you'd enjoy it, but just, you know, the extent to which you're enjoying it at the moment. Do you think you're going to regret having gone for that Platinum, though, and doing these really badly designed dungeons? No, because the bosses in the dungeons, some of them are fucking amazing. Some of them are absolutely (laughs) great. Quite genuinely, some of the most exciting boss fights that I've had in the game have also been in these dungeons. It's just the dungeon bit in between the boss fights that it's awful like most of them are terrible some of them are like totally fine like i'm maybe being a bit harsh here but a lot of them are just genuinely crap and quite repetitive but the actual boss fights some of them are so fucking great like they're really really good and really really tense and very difficult some of them as well but no i don't think i'm going to regret it because i want to play more of the game i want to keep on playing in a similar manner to when i played hollow knight actually when i was playing that I chose to go and do all the additional DLC. I chose to beat every single boss. I chose to go through the whole thing and beat the Radiance, which is like the secret final true game end the boss, which is incredibly difficult. I beat the game and I had 109% completion, I think, when I finished <laughs> Hollow Knight. Also in a similar manner to Hollow Knight, I find myself on the Bloodborne wikis quite frequently reading up about the lore, similar to what oh, I was doing God. with Hollow Knight as well. <laughs> and I was just like absolutely engrossed with it right now. I really have completely fallen in love with it. I really have. I stunned myself by how much i love it was it is so so good 
Amazing, good stuff. I'm really glad to hear it. I, I wonder whether that's Metroid games themselves or Bloodborne specifically and Hollow Knight specifically, I suppose. But yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to find out, like your final thoughts on it once you've rolled credits and where it sits in relation to games like God of War. That's that's a massive comparison you just drew there, which like we'll, we'll definitely be talking about that in future. <laughs> yeah, I think that we will. And I think that it has to be considered in that manner. Like I genuinely think that it must be because I can basically find no complaints about the game at all. Like apart from things like oh the menu system's a bit fiddly yeah but like who the fuck cares do you know what yeah, i mean in yeah, the grand yeah. scheme of things like it, it doesn't matter other than that i basically have very little to complain about with the game at all i've enjoyed it from start to finish basically it's been amazing all right and that's probably enough gushing about bloodborne for this week <laughs> let's go into the news all right and news item number one in an interview with kotaku xbox head phil spencer has said that he doesn't have to sell bethesda games on any other platform other than his own in order to make back the 7.5 billion they purchased bethesda for when asked the question is it possible to recoup the 7.5 billion invested if you don't sell the elder scrolls 6 on playstation phil spencer replied with this statement yes I don't want to be flip about that. This deal was not done to take games away from another player base like that. Nowhere in the documentation that we put together was how do we keep other players from playing these games? We want more people to be able to play games, not fewer people to be able to go play games. But I'll also say in the model, I'm just answering directly the question that you had, when I think about where people are going to be playing and the number of devices that we had, and we have xCloud and PC and Game Pass and our console base, I don't have to go ship these games on any other platform other than the platforms that we support in order to kind of make the deal work for us whatever that means so in that statement which was obviously taken from him actually speaking it wasn't a written (laughs) statement which is why that maybe sounded a little bit funny (laughs) he is saying that we want more people to play games but at the same time saying we do not have to put these games on other consoles so i mean read into that whatever you will However, Lewis, I know that your thoughts on this were a bit sceptical and that you thought that they would perhaps have to sell Bethesda games, specifically the Elder Scrolls games, Fallout games, Doom, games of that ilk, yeah. on other systems in order to recoup this $7.5 billion investment. So what are your thoughts on that statement, I suppose? I, I don't think my opinion has changed, to be honest. I, straight off the bat, I have to say, obviously it's possible that that isn't going to happen, right? That the Xbox are going to make the decision to keep everything totally exclusive on their platform you would be daft to say that that's not a a distinct and real possibility but to me i think it's interesting the way that that question was phrased to him effectively can that 7.5 billion be recouped if you don't sell on playstation he says yes but he then goes on to say it's never really been our intention to take games away from players and that's been a huge part of xbox's marketing over the last five years more than that potentially like through the period in which they've been effectively losing to sony that's been the beat of their drum everyone should get to play whatever they want wherever they want as easily as possible so i I still don't take this to mean that it definitely won't happen i think he's saying that they don't have to do it to my mind it's the most likely thing is still that some of those major franchises will come to playstation they might come to playstation later and they'll be full price and they'll probably be in that way nintendo does quite hard to get at a reduced price on playstation because that way xbox can always say you can play this more cheaply on our system you don't even have to pay a normal game price you can just subscribe to game pass and get them to my mind though like he mentions their console base the systems that they have game pass etc but game pass at the last count had like 15 million subscribers we know that the xbox one currently has a way smaller install base than the playstation unless he's only talking about pc which still requires people to have the tech to be able to run some of these games i don't know that they do have the numbers there to, to mean that he categorically can recoup that money I'm not actually sure at all that they are thinking about it in those terms, though. I don't think that they're thinking about how do we recoup this $7.5 billion. Because see if they don't recoup that $7.5 billion in, say, five to ten years. For Microsoft, like, so what? Like, it's not that big a loss. For Microsoft, really, they are a trillion-dollar company. $7.5 billion is a lot of money. No fucking doubt about that in any capacity. But in the spectrum of Microsoft, like, is it really? Not really, I don't think. And I'm still very much of the opinion that two years from now, when we're talking about the release of the Elder Scrolls games or Starfield or maybe the next Fallout games on the horizon by this point, I honestly do not think that those games will ever 
appear on a PlayStation 5, like even at a later date. I think that's almost the best case scenario. You posited that as the most likely scenario. I think that that is the best case scenario. The best case scenario is that they appear on PlayStation six months to a year after they appear on Xbox and on Games Pass and they will be full price and they will never be discounted. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think they will ever be discounted on PlayStation. I almost think that that is the best case scenario and I think that the most likely scenario is that Xbox do not want to publish games that are going to continue to line their competitors' pockets. That's my stance on it and still very much believe that the days of Bethesda games on PlayStation are going to very quickly be over. So why wouldn't he just say that then, though? Like, why this because fairly, really Because that would be really a fucking statement? really bad PR move, I think. I think that would bring a lot of hostility towards Xbox, and it might have a lot of negative impacts on their console sales. Like, this is immediately mm. running up to a console launch here. You don't want to hit the world of gaming with a massive negative PR hit like that. And I don't think that they will ever make a statement where it's going to be like, nah, these are never going to be on PlayStation 5. They'll always say wishy-washy things like this where it's going to be, oh, well, we'll take it on a case-by-case basis. We'll see what happens in the future or whatever. But really, I don't know why they would be planning to develop for a competitor's console. That to me just sounds absolutely mad. It's sort of the same argument that could have been made for playstation and the playstation 3 era like if they had developed the last of us the first last of us for the xbox 360 the market leader at that point they could have made more money but they didn't because they wanted to keep that on their platform so that their platform would be more valuable they could have done the same with the uncharted series or any of their playstation exclusives yeah but they didn't because i think that that is a really bad strategy i mean there's just a couple of things there though because the, the gap between the two companies at that point wasn't so substantial and i think more important well, maybe not by the last of us part two but when the first uncharted the game came out it definitely was a big gap oh yeah it was, it was a big gap sure but it's nothing like what it currently is i don't think i mean don't quote me on that but the other thing and and why it would affect the attitudes of gamers is obviously that these are franchises that people have long histories with and just the, that is true, that and, is true. I, and i do think that thing about like goodwill or whatever there's one element of that but if they said right now oh no categorically you can only play the next elder scrolls game or the next folly on xbox then even if people are mad about it if you want to play those games then you're going to go and buy your xbox Xbox. Whereas right now, even people like you and I are having, the, and plenty of people with less gaming literacy will not even be imagining this scenario. But people like you and I are discussing whether or not this will happen, and that allows us, if we are huge Fallout fans, which obviously I'm not, but to go and buy a PlayStation, thinking, well, it's probably going to come. Whereas if Xbox just said, oh, it definitely isn't going to come, then if I really want to play Fallout, I would have to buy an Xbox. You know, even if I was mad about it. I, I do understand what you're saying, mm. but I just think that that is a massive negative PR hit. Yeah. That they absolutely do not want when they're about to launch two yeah. major consoles for sure <laughs> but i just i think that they're delaying a hit. it's going to be clear at some point you know i mean agreed it's definitely <laughs> going to be clear at some point i just don't know how soon that point will be because obviously we have deathloop and ghostwire coming to playstation yeah. as timed exclusives so it's going to be a little while down the line <laughs> All right, news item number two. And from the same interview, I'm not sure that we've ever had two news items back to back from the same interview list, but here we go. Phil Spencer has also said that long term, he expects the Series S to outsell the X. He also acknowledged that developers will have to, quote, work to optimize their games for both systems. This is due to the shortfalls of the Series S hardware compared to the X. And this also follows on from David Cage's comments that we discussed last week. He also explicitly stated that he is hoping that the lower price will entice, quote, second owners, e.g. people who use a PlayStation 5 as their primary console, will also buy an Xbox Series S just because it is a much more palatable price than buying two consoles at $500. You've got your primary console at $500, then you've got a secondary console at $300. And this is basically what I said before. When the Series S was first announced, I said that I think that it will probably outsell the X. It may not outsell the X at launch, but I think long term it probably will, just because that price point is so, so accessible to so many people. And the way that they are targeting this, also at gamers like me and you, Lewis, specifically gamers like <laughs> me and you, Lewis, who are probably going to end up with an S at some point as their secondary console and effectively as a Games Pass machine, yeah, I mean, they've kind of done it. I can't really say anything negative about this because I'm probably going to fall into exactly the situation that he's laid out. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I, th- I mean, it shows you that Phil Spencer understands the strategy inside out. He understands the market, where people are gaming, how they want to game, the types of games people want to play. You know, he understands that for some people, the, the X is the thing that they're going to want because they want the best version of particularly, I suppose, of Halo uh, and to play the best games at the highest quality. But for a lot of us, the exclusives that the PlayStation offer outweigh all of that, as we've seen in this generation as well. The S will effectively, I think, look a lot like the Switch has done this generation. It's where you go to play stuff that's maybe not the absolute key game for you to play this year, but you want to give it a shot, or you've got a whole slew of interesting games on Game Pass that you want to give a a shot to. And I think people will start to pick up the S in the way that you and I did and various others did with the Switch, where you were like, eventually there'll be that one game that's on, and you know, probably be a Bethesda game, that is only on Game Pass and isn't on PlayStation, like when Breath of the Wild or Mario Odyssey came out where we were like well we have to buy that thing now and i think the s will absolutely clean up when that becomes the case you know yeah totally totally agree i think that it all hinges on games pass you know i think that that is what the box is made for it's made to be a tiny little well certainly in comparison to the size of the other two consoles (laughs) machine that is just a games pass machine you know i just keep on saying that it's a games pass machine and that is honestly how i think about it in my head like if i want to play something on xbox chances are it's going to be on games pass and if it is on games pass I'm perfectly happy playing it on a quote's lesser piece of hardware and paying a lot less money than having to go out and buy a Series X, precisely as Phil Spencer has said. (laughs) Two quick fire questions for you on that though, Mark. One, if the S outsells the X by the end of the generation, does that represent a failure of the X, do you think, as a strategy? No, because I think that Xbox are aware enough that they probably won't win that battle with PlayStation simply because they don't have the games. And I think, as we've literally just discussed, Phil Spencer is very aware of the situation in and around games, and I think that he is well enough aware of that. I actually think that this is a massive win for them because it will cause them to sell way, way more consoles than if they just had two high-end consoles like PlayStation does. Oh, totally in that sense and it allows people to get into that sphere but secondly we've obviously talked quite a lot about the potential for the S to be holding back game development as recently as last week with David Cage's comments if the S does outsell the X does that mean that this coming generation is going to be lesser than it may have been because if the S outsells the the premier console on that side then it's, it feels a little bit like the battle might become one of the PlayStation's incredibly brilliant exclusives. I'm holding my hand really high in the air here. And then the Series S is kind of holding back of the rest of the pack a bit further down. Well, that's interesting. And to be honest with you, I don't really have an answer to mm. that. I think it all remains to be seen. But honestly, I think that that is a distinct possibility. All right, and news item number three. PlayStation has unveiled the PS5's UI at last loose. And I think it looks pretty good. It's a bit of a departure from the PS4's UI, but it still looks super clean and it has a lot of remnants from the PS4, I would say, but is looking a lot nicer, I think, anyway. I think it looks good. And unlike the Xbox, who decided to keep their UI basically the same across generations, which I think is a bit of a mistake because I don't really think the Xbox's UI is all that good and it's a bit complicated, whereas this looks super clean and nice and slick. Some of the features that they showed off just real quickly before we get into the sort of meat of the presentation was they just showed the console going very quickly from rest mode straight into a game, obviously powered by the super fast SSD of the PlayStation 5, which is just a nice feature to see, quite frankly. Then they also showed switching between games very, very quickly with very little load time, which again was just really good to see. And because the controller has a microphone in it, you can now dictate text to speech, which is a feature I will be using a lot less because scrolling around and typing in in in-game keyboards is one of the worst things in all the video games, I think. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) But anyway, what did you think of the look? How did you think it looked just surface level? Surface level, I thought it looked, yeah, really nice. The use of really big kind of splash images for a lot of the game. So if you've seen anything from this, it's probably the Ratchet and Clank still that sits behind the UI when you're, I think that was when they were showing yeah, you. Yeah, it's like, like a big wallpaper, basically, right? Basically, yeah. And that was for the store part of the, the whole UI. But it looked like, you know, when they went across to Destruction All-Stars, 
I think a different image popped up at that point and yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. we saw the, the sack boy stuff at the beginning of the presentation all of that I think just using the the glory of the games themselves to, to use up most of the real estate on screen I thought was really nice like you said a lot of the tiles and a lot of the kind of intricacies of how the menu navigation works looks like it's come from PS4 but with some tweaks which I'm totally fine with I think there's elements of the PS4's UI which is a little tricky sometimes just I can never find the capture gallery every time I'm trying to find it it's never where I think it's going to be I hope things like that have just been made slightly easier or if you could just like pin things in place that would be fine but overall I thought it looked really really smart yeah well Lewis I think things like that are going to be easier to get to because of the first cool thing that they showed off which is the command center which is brought up by a tap of the PS button which allows you to access audio levels power controller battery levels your microphone notifications I think you can check your downloads and things like that from this bar as well all of which can be done without actually leaving the game. So it's sort of like a taskbar on a computer or a tablet, but it means that you're not leaving the game. And to me, this is a pretty major improvement over the PS4. In terms of UI, we're just talking about UI here, and I think UI is really all about the little things and how do we make the little things easier. And not having to go in and out of your game all the time just to do basically anything is just a nice touch. I think that that points to the ethos of the whole UI, which is basically keep the player in the game as much as possible. And I think that that is a really, really nice move. And I know for a fact that if you take a picture, it showed you in the trailer that it would be on your taskbar as like a recent piece of media or something like that. So that will be easier to access list. So there you go. (laughs) The second cool thing that they showed off, or what I thought was cool that they showed off, was the in-game help. And this is accessed via activity cards quotes which themselves highlight in-game tasks that you might want to complete in a given level or whatever. And associated with them is official in-game help for each task. Again, this keeps you in the game rather than having to Google something or look up a YouTube video if this works the way that they say it will work. These can also take the form of videos themselves and show you hints of what to do or where to go. These videos can also be put picture in picture while you're playing the game as well, which I thought was a really, really nice touch. So you can watch the video as you are playing the game. Very, very cool. Also in the activities tabs, you can see how much you have progressed at a particular activity or on a particular level or however it is that they're broken down, which is quite nice. And it also tells you a time estimate of how long PlayStation think that it's going to take you to complete the rest of said task, which again is just a nice little touch more than anything. And you can use these cards to jump to specific tasks within a level, it looks like as well. So if you wanted to do well, I think the task was to find a piece of clothing or whatever in Sackboy. I think that was basically what was shown. Yeah. And he just clicked on the task and the game just loaded very, very quickly because of the SSD to where he had to be to go and complete that task, which was really, really cool. I just think that that was a very quick way of moving around the game, you know, and you don't have to deal with a lot of menus or loading screens. It's just in here, find the task you want to do, click on it, and then you're in that area that you need to do it. It is worth pointing out that not all games are going to support this, but I bet that PlayStation will be pushing it quite hard (laughs) and obviously all their games will undoubtedly support it. Overall, I just thought it was a pretty cool feature. I have no idea how useful that is actually going to be in practice, but if it works the way that they say that it's going to work or that they were shown that it's going to work and it gets buy-in from other developers, it is a very cool thing. It definitely is a cool thing. That buy-in from other developers feels fairly key, but as you said, it's likely that it's just going to be you know, PlayStation Studios games or, or other, you know, PlayStation exclusives maybe that focus in on it. One thing that I think it will be great for though is for younger gamers. I don't think this stuff gets talked about enough really, but the idea... Yeah, kids, you know what I mean? They're struggling, absolutely. It's kids that are struggling, but it also means that they don't have to go and find tips on YouTube or just on other websites. And I bet you this ties in really closely with like the parental controls that will come with the PS5 because it allows parents to know that they're getting that kind of content in game rather than you know heading off into the wilds of the internet so i think we could see some really cool stuff come out of it like that it looked really cool the way it all worked and how quickly things were happening but yeah i just i'm a bit skeptical as to whether you know the last of us part three will be making extensive use of some of this stuff maybe but you know i don't know beyond that it'll be interesting to see anyway it will be interesting to see and the third thing that they showed off, which I also thought was quite cool, was the parties and sharing functionality as well. This is two things that I basically don't use at all on the PlayStation no, 4, <laughs> but it does look much improved on the PlayStation 5. 
Firstly, parties seem as if they'll function much more like chat rooms and frankly, much more like Discord. So you could have your own Destiny party or your own COD party with specific players that you want to play those specific games with or whatever. And you can it also look as if you can share very specific things with very specific parties. And one of those things is that you can actually share your gameplay and share your screen as you are playing a game. People within your party can watch you play your game picture in picture as they play their game which is again it's a cool feature i just don't know if i will use that very much but it's like having your own little let's play within your party you know it's just quite cool absolutely i could see us just pinging each other gameplay videos from wherever we're at so you would be sending me your bloodborne level just to go like look what amazing thing i just did even if it's just for that i think oh, that'd be a cool feature don't you know? tempt me you'll be inundated <laughs> <laughs> They also showed some of the online matchmaking and things like that, where if someone in your party starts a game and is in a lobby or is within a game that you aren't playing, then you can quickly, using the command center, just jump into that party, into that game very, very quickly. Again, all of this powered by the super fast SSD of the PlayStation 5, which again, is just a quite a cool feature. It just saves faffing around the menus or anything like that. It's just straight into command center, pick the lobby that all your friends are in playing, whatever game it is that they're playing, and then you are straight there. And as well, just another nice feature that they showed off was if you do share a piece of media with a party, that the devs deem will be a spoiler or could be conceived as a spoiler, your friends would get a warning before they opened that piece of media, which again is just a nice thing. It's not anything groundbreaking or anything like that. It's just a nice little touch that I think shows that they put a bit of thought into this, you know, and I just like to see that. All right, and news item number four, NBA 2K21 has introduced unskippable video ads in their loading screens. This is particularly insidious as the game has been released for over a month now and all the reviews are in and the game's high purchase release window has also passed. Last month, EA got into a similar situation by adding ads into UFC 4 during in-game replays. However, these were quickly removed after a fan backlash and an apology was issued. 2K, however, have not responded to the controversy as of this recording, and unlike EA, who just flashed up an image of an advertisement, 2K are putting full unskippable video ads on their loading screens. It is also worth noting that whether you are on PlayStation or Xbox, or if you're on a high-end PC with a super fast SSD, the ad will play in its entirety regardless. This basically means that the loading times are likely being artificially lengthened to show the ad in full, regardless of your hardware. And these games will be coming to the PS5 and the Series X, which are selling themselves on super fast or nearly non-existent load times, but I somehow bet that this ad will still be shown in full. This is a full price game, and it is already full of some of the worst predatory microtransactions in gaming right now. Quite frankly, I hate this. I hate this so much. I think this is scumbaggery of the absolute highest order. When we spoke about EA, however, you were somewhat sympathetic towards this, whereas I thought that this was a very, very slippery slope to be on. And then here we are, falling down that slope. <laughs> yeah, we, we do seem to be sliding down the slope, perhaps. Yeah, to roll back to the UFC thing, sympathetic's maybe not the right word exactly, but I just thought that those weren't... The way that EA had implemented them, not good, should have been there from the start if you're going to include them. All of that stuff, absolutely, you know. They have to be... And 2K should have been upfront about their intentions to do this and putting stuff in after the review window. All of that stuff is pretty murky. I just thought with the UFC ones that they were not intrusive one really in the in the broad scheme of things i can't remember now if they were skippable or not but given that replays and games tend to be I, I could imagine that they were and it kind of felt within the tone of the of the game itself because of what ufc is and how we're used to seeing these things i don't watch a lot of ufc but i do watch a lot of wrestling and i watch a lot of football and getting ads in game like that are not sort of unusual there's a whole other argument about whether that matters in the gaming space i, I admit I think that some form of this is inevitable because publishers will try any form of money making and I think that some of the issues that come out of microtransactions and loot boxes are much, 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 much more socially problematic in terms of addiction and and that kind of thing. But it's not either or. It's not, well, well, we can have the ads or the microtransactions. It's both. They have both. 
2K have some of the worst microtransactions in all video games. Yeah. And they have advertising. I, that, I completely agree with you on that, Mark. My point about UFC was kind of predicated on the idea that it could be one or the other. Or not just just that it might mean that if you can sell adverts here, you don't need to charge for DLC here. Uh, if you know what I mean. That there could be other models for this. However, if you're going to do all of these things, then it's a problem. The other thing about NBA to be mentioned is that it was, I think, the first game that was confirmed to be going up to $70 or whatever that's going to be in pounds when the transition happens for the next gen. I'm pretty certain NBA 2K21 was the first game that was officially 70 bucks. It was certainly one of them. And so for that game to have released on current gen and a month later put in adverts ahead of its next gen game release, which is going to cost 70 bucks, all of that together is not good. So I totally agree. As much as my, my point around UFC was basically like we as gamers need to have a an honest conversation about what is coming and what we can accept and what we can't accept. I think, absolutely, this is something that we can't accept. Well, good. I'm very (laughs) happy to hear that from you, Lewis, quite frankly, because I think this is abhorrent. And I don't like the UFC thing at all, either. I think that that is abhorrent as well. I just think that it is less abhorrent than this, because (laughs) this is artificially increasing load times. That, to me, is the the key as well. The artificially increasing load times is bullshit. If the whole premise (laughs) of next gen is is bullshit. I mean, if you're on a high-end PC, that loading screen should go away much faster than if you're playing on an OG PS4. And it doesn't. They're the same time. So they must be artificially increasing the load times on high-end PCs so that they control their ads. And that is fucking shit. And I have nothing good to say about this at all. I think that this is awful. I really don't know how we fight this, to be honest, because these games sell a ridiculous amount to gamers that are casual and will not want to engage in these types of conversations. But honestly, I think that this is absolutely fucking despicable, frankly. All right, Lewis, after that rant, finishing off, as we always do, with a couple of shout-outs. Shout-out number one, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit has released this week. This is the augmented reality Mario Kart game that sees you driving a toy car around your living room, effectively. Currently sitting at a 74 on Metacritic, but honestly, who cares? If you're buying this game, you're buying this game for a novelty experience. You're not buying this game because it is the best Mario Kart experience that you can have. Having said that, the game does seem to work. The augmented reality stuff does seem to work and work well. However, if you deviate from, quotes ideal conditions, apparently things can go quite disastrously pretty quickly. And for 100 quid, it is quite an expensive novelty, let's be honest. Yeah, that is an expensive novelty, and it's definitely not for a lot of quote-unquote kind of core gamers or even core Mario Kart players, I don't imagine. But, Mark, this, I can feel it in my bones, it's going to be a big Christmas hit. You can just imagine these things getting set up in homes on Christmas morning up and down the country, so I think Nintendo is going to feel pretty okay about that review score overall. Yeah, like I said, it really doesn't matter for games like this. (laughs) It's for the novelty, you kind of know what you're getting. Alright, shout out number two. Ghost of Tsushima Legends has also come out this week. This is the multiplayer DLC for Ghost of Tsushima, where you can either play as a two-player co-op in story missions, or you can play four-player survival missions. The DLC is much more based on Japanese myth and legend than the main story was, and takes on a much more magical feel, I would say. And the response to the DLC has been incredibly positive, to the point that some seem to find it hard to believe that the DLC is free. You were pretty interested in this, Lewis, weren't you? I was, yeah, I still am. Um, I think it's coming at the right moment. It's not too far away from the release of the base game. I've Personally, I've not long since finished it, so I'm, I'm still kind of in that headspace of wanting more. It's the co-op missions more than the kind of four-player wave-based stuff that does it for me. I just think the idea of exploring some of those myths and legends is interesting, but playing the game alongside someone else could be really fun. And it might be a little bit of a nod to what might be in the future for the franchise. I just thought it was a really interesting package they put together and you know correctly priced if they want people just to dive in and see how it feels you know yeah three is a pretty good price isn't it <laughs> i've got to say well listen if you want to play it online you can hit me up anytime but i will not be holding my breath <laughs> All right, and shout out number three. Marvel's Avengers has delayed the release of the Kate Bishop DLC and the release of the next gen versions of the game. The next gen versions of the game have now been pushed to 2021 with no official release date. And the Kate Bishop DLC, which was supposed to come out this month, has been pushed back to an indetermined date. Now, this comes off the back of the conversation that we had last week 
where it seems as though people were losing interest in the game quite quickly and the concurrent player count was way, way, way down. There has been quite a long update statement from Crystal Dynamics, which we will link in the show notes over at players2.com, which does a lot of apologising. But this also leads back to our topic of the week conversation last week, where we were talking about how online service games like this seem to continually get it wrong. And they seem to be just getting it wrong again. They need to be better communicating with their audience and they need to be honest with their audience and they need to set dates. They need to have dates to look forward to. If you're going to delay something, don't delay it for an indeterminate amount of time. If you're going to go down the route of delaying something, then have a date where you're delaying it too and hit that date if this is the most important thing, you know? Even if you have to push that date by a week or so, that's not a big deal. But things like this and just keeping your audience guessing is a very quick way to lose players. And I also worry that with the next gen games being pushed into next year, although I assume it will be early next year, that they will then struggle to find this audience again. Because by that time, a lot of people will already have moved on to new hardware. And at that time, Avengers will basically be old news, you know? And there will be a lot of next-gen content to be consumed by that point. You won't want to be playing a six-month-old game. So I worry about this game now, man. I really do. I thought it had like an okay launch and I thought it might have been able to build on that, but it seems to have went in the other direction. That's the point that I was just going to make, Mark, is that it feels increasingly like we had both Anthem and Fallout 76 as examples of bad games released badly and then failing. But this was actually, by all accounts, a pretty decent game that is now, it's just not looking good, really. I, I totally agree with what you just said about the possibility of audience retention next year it's just not going to happen at all no i don't think so either and i think it is a big worry for square Enix and crystal dynamics as well all right Lewis, and on that note i think it's time for a beer and then we'll be back with topic of the week and we are back for topic of the week topic of the week this week is games we haven't played from this generation of consoles list it is indeed, Mark, yeah. So we've just been thinking a lot here about the loose ends of this generation, I guess. We had a conversation a few weeks ago about some of the best games of this generation. I think we've probably got more to go through on that as well. But also, I think maybe more importantly, right now we're both playing games in Hollow Knight and Bloodborne that have been you know, major hits from this current generation, but also games that we for a long time had been talking about playing and trying to find the time to get around to. The these in particular being quite long games, I suppose, that we had to actually carve out time for. But it just made me think a lot about the other games <laughs> that have come out over the last six or seven years that I have at some point been determined to play or noticed someone else playing and thought, I really need to give that a go. Or even that we've talked about it kind of at length on the show for one reason or another and thought, oh, I actually, I really want to go back to that. Um, and so I guess we're talking about games that we've wanted to play that maybe we think that we might get through before the console transition or that we might try and pick up in the early days of the next generation. And maybe some of these we'll have to just admit isn't it's just never going to happen, Mark. It's sometimes you've just got yeah. to say that about your backlist, you know? It's a hard one to admit about the backlog. I like to think that I don't have a backlog. Yeah. I, in my head, frame it as there are just games that I haven't played and games that I have. I don't have a backlog. If I get around to playing one of the games that I haven't played, great. If I don't, that's also okay. Yeah, I would love to feel like that. I don't keep a list or anything, but certainly even just for things thinking about this for recording tonight I suddenly was going oh Christ I meant to play that and oh, I've got that downloaded on my PlayStation but I've never switched it on yet so uh, oh man it's the Steam library every time I look at that I'm like Jesus why haven't I played any of these games <laughs> Anyway, Mark, I think just to start us off, I wonder if you've got a sense of like what the what the number one game in this list would be. What is the one game from this generation that you've yet to play that you think that you absolutely are dying to? Well, I think there's two really, but I think the top one, if I'm being honest with myself, the game that I want to play most from this generation that I haven't is probably Persona 5. Nice. Yep, For no yep. other reason other than... It's a fantastic JRPG, and I love fantastic JRPGs. Like, I've, everyone loved it. It's a series that I've been eyeing for a long time. I would say that one of the other games that I'd want to play from this generation is, well, this is a bit of a cheat, but Persona 4 Golden that recently <laughs> came to Steam. I would very much like to play that as well. But I think Persona 5, yeah, is probably the number one for me. What about you? I've got a couple as well that, that float near the top of that list. And I'll say, just to kick off, that Bloodborne has been one of mine for a long time. And hearing you 
gush about it as you've done in the last <laughs> few shows and even more extensively off air and in text messages uh, to me yeah there's been a lot of long text messages <laughs> about how good Which Bloodborne is <laughs> I'm really glad to be getting so yeah that to me has just solidified Bloodborne as a game and a representative of a whole type of game i.e. the, the Soulsborne games and everything that From's been doing over the last few years that I've really wanted to get into and I did put a couple of hours into Sekiro so I would, I would include that in this list as well even if that's cheating slightly but I think now even though I own Bloodborne because of PS Plus I think I'm probably going to wait until it comes to the PS Plus collection on PS5 um, yeah, yeah. I suspect that's what I'm going to do just because I don't really see where the time for it is now between essentially between now and Christmas or whenever I happen to pick up a PS5 so there would be that the other one which might be a little bit more of a surprise because it's a much kind of lesser game in, in some senses but one that I've been meaning to play for years and years now and just have never bothered making the time for it is Dishonored 2 and generally the Dishonored franchise oh wow 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 yeah it's another franchise that is absolutely adored by many many people that I have never touched I've never touched the Dishonored franchise yeah I actually have the first one for PS3 I think which I have a feeling that you gave me actually but I was going to say Lewis I think I gave you that yeah I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> which you which means so I bought that game never and then gave it to you <laughs> <laughs> and I have n- I never even installed it because I think it was quite late in the in the generation I think it was very late in the generation yeah, yeah. but Dishonored 2 has just been one of those games that sat for me for, for a long time as one that I know that I would get something from because of that the way that the the systems interplay with each other and the way that the world affects the gameplay and the gameplay affects the world I just think that kind of game makes me think of Metal Gear Solid 5 that's how that game played and worked so well was that it had so many different things happening at once in ways that you could affect what was happening around you so that's one for me I don't know if I will ever actually get around to playing it though because it's been so long and we're about to hit a new generation I'm almost certainly going to play Deathloop before I go back and play a previous arcane game so maybe it's never going to happen well i have a game that feels similarly to that it is one game that i know i'm going to say and many people listening to this are going to go please god play it it's so good and that game is the witcher (laughs) very good i have just never ever really got around to playing i know that it's great i know almost undoubtedly that i will love it and i just don't know now when it's going to happen you know Mm -hmm. although having said that to be fair if I can find time to beat Persona 5 which is by all accounts a 90 hour JRPG then I should be able to find time to beat The Witcher as well but for me Persona 5 is just a far bigger draw than The Witcher honestly is just much more my kind of game but yeah that's one that unfortunately just might sit on the backlog for a very long time to infinity (laughs) (laughs) well that would be a a real sad loss because i know that you would enjoy it i know that i would enjoy it i'm not debating no i I, know that i would love it absolutely (laughs) not but i I wonder whether your eventual experience with cyberpunk might be one of those moments where you go oh actually i've got to go back and experience that now as well maybe Maybe it will be. It's the kind of thing that I think you do sometimes. To move on from that, some of the other games, I guess there's a lot of indie games from this generation that I have still been dying to get to. I put together a very quick indie list of games that I haven't played from this generation that look so good (laughs) that I just know that I'm not going to get around to playing half of them. And keep in mind that I own a lot of the games in this list and I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to play half of them. But Axiom Verge, Hyperlight, Drifter, Katana Zero, Grease, The Witness, Super Hot, Baba Is You, Return of the Obra Dinn, Outer Wilds, Blasphemous, Observation, Disco Elysium, Shovel Knight, to name but a few, <laughs> are all amazing, amazing indie games from this generation that I would love to play that I'm not convinced I'm going to get enough time to play, at least all of them certainly, but even the ones that I want to play from that, even the ones that I own from that list, I'm not even sure that I will realistically get around to playing them anytime soon. Yeah, it almost feels feels like some of those you'd need to it's like creating the bloodborne time you've just got to say like the next two weeks are just about getting through these indie games and playing them back to back to make the time so many of the games that you just listed there are also on my list grease the messenger unfinished swan for me oh man unfinished swan's great oxen free i've put firewatch on my list which i have started but i've probably played about an hour of so i'm counting that as one that i am still determined to actually go back and finish now what remains of edith finch is very high on my list of games yeah 
yeah, to play man, still. Yeah. Again, these are some that I've got installed um, and have been meaning to go back to. And also Super Hot was one that's just always kind of intrigued me that I, I don't think I would love or really, really play for a long time, but that I might, you know, I would just like to get a shot of it because it seems so different to a lot of other games, you know? Yeah, I totally agree, man. Uh, Super Hot is high on my list. Again, The Outer Wilds and Disco Elysium are more in the double A space maybe than the indie yeah. space, but definitely games that I know I know that I would love them but really realistically I don't know when I'm going to get around to playing those games that's oh man there's, I mean those two games in particular are just must plays in, in yeah. my book Return of the Obra Dinn as well yeah. recently went on sale and I didn't buy it because I was like am I ever going to get around to playing this am I ever going to get around to actually playing this game because I've sort of stopped doing that to myself. I've sort of stopped buying games in the expectation that I will one day get around to playing it when they're on sale. I think I would just rather save the money overall and pay a higher price when I know that I'm actually going to yeah. go and play a game, you know? That's an interesting point. I, I think I quite often do do that thing of going, I'll buy it now because then I might get around to it. And it just sits in your library, you know? Yeah, for example, I own Axiom Verge, Hyperlight Drifter, Grease, The Witness, Super Hot, The Outer Wilds, Blasphemous, Observation, and I will likely play half of them, maybe, ever, probably less than that. I mean, realistically, probably less than that. Never mind the other ones on that list that are arguably better games, you know? Like Disco Elysium. Like, I don't own Disco Elysium. I know that I'd love Disco Elysium, but I think I might be more likely to get around to playing that than Katana Zero, for example, yeah. you know? I do think there's something in that, like, if you've already bought a game or you own a game through PS Plus or whatever, and, and Game Pass is an interesting part of this point I'm going to make I think sometimes if you have the game and you haven't played it there's almost a psychological thing going on there where you're like oh there's a reason that I have not got to that yet and as you just said something like Disco Elysium comes along and you think actually I'd rather play that than any of these things that I currently already have ignored for six months or a year or whatever it might be it almost taints them if they're in your pile too long you know there's like a reason yeah, they're in the I pile. get that man I get that there is definitely a psychological hurdle there at least to some extent definitely totally understand that yeah a question that I'd like to ask in this, Lewis, is what do you think I have missed from this generation? Well, I mean, you've covered so much ground, and particularly in the last year or two, because I always think about how my early days of this generation, I was a much more avid gamer at that point than you were, whereas it feels like in the last couple of years, you've just absolutely motored your way through a, a hell of a lot of games. That's because I've had time, <laughs> which has been lovely. <laughs> to be honest, you've named a few of the ones that I was going to say for you, the, the Witcher 3 being very high up on that list, because it's you know a phenomenal game. Disco Elysium, Outer Wilds. Yeah are all there I'm not sure if you said it it might have been in your longer list but Baba is You is absolutely Baba is You yep. those games to me particularly in the last year or two and Return of the Obra Dinn oh man yeah. those are the ones for me that really along with like Celeste and a few other games from that kind of 2017 2018 period that all kind of came out and just felt like they were doing something different in that indie space yeah. There was just an eruption of indies around about that time. And honestly, I think that one of the things that will define the PS4 slash Xbox One generation for me is the indie games oh, yeah. that were available on it. I mean, 100%. I would say of the games that I have a list of here, I think almost all of the games that I think that I would realistically play, apart from Persona 5, are indie games. Mm -hmm. I've got other big AAA games here. For example, the Titanfall series is yep. always something I've wanted to get around to that I've never played. Resident Evil 7 as well. It's something that I might get around to playing in preparation for Resident Evil 8 whenever that comes out. But, uh, I mean, realistically, maybe not, actually. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think that really the indie games from this generation really are what will stick in my memory anyway about this generation. Totally, yeah. I 100% agree with that sentiment, absolutely. Because I've only got a few games on my list that are real kind of AAA numbers. Stuff like Final Fantasy VII Remake, which I'm still fairly hopeful I'll, yes. get, I'll carve out some time for. It's um, definitely one you've missed. <laughs> yeah, Resident Evil 7, absolutely. The Hitman games, which I did play a, a, oh, yeah, yeah. a chunk of the first one of the reboot. Um, but I, basically now I'm of the mindset that if I'm going to do that I'll just wait for three because it in incorporates the others but yeah the indie games on my list feel much more important to me as games to make sure and go back and experience you know what game would you pick for me though 
I would pick Nier Automata for you, Bruce. <laughs> I knew it was going to be that. <laughs> I think that Nier Automata is one of the best games I have ever played. And for me, is definitely one of the best games of this generation. In fact, I would actually recommend that if you were going to carve out time to play either Final Fantasy VII Remake or Nier Automata, I would highly recommend that you just play Nier Automata over Final Fantasy VII Remake. Whoa. I would say comfortably, actually, that Nier Automata is better than Final Fantasy VII Remake. Holy shit. I never it is so, it is so that. good. That, that is high praise indeed and final fantasy the original final fantasy is one of my favorite games ever so this is very very high praise the way that it tells a story in a video game is incredibly incredibly unique and is so wonderfully done and it's got incredible combat but as well like there's this harrowing very actually touching story going on throughout it as well and the end sequence to all of it which I won't spoil for you, is just one of the best things that I've ever seen in any video game ever. It's tremendous. Like, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Final Fantasy VII Remake should definitely be high on your list as well, though. I think you should definitely play both. <laughs> but other ones that I was thinking about for you was Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal because they are awesome and I think that you would love them even though you don't particularly like shows yeah, yeah. but you liked Wolfenstein and this is like Wolfenstein cranked up to 11 yeah. monsters and I liked a bit of Doom 2016 that I did play with you so yeah I totally yeah, agree with there that you go. Yeah. I also think that the Bayonetta games very very good and I think that you would like them a lot as well and a game that I know that you started but never finished that you definitely definitely need to finish is madness that you've not finished this game is Cuphead yeah that's true yeah that's kind of on my pile of shame at the moment as one that I know I have to go back and finish I mean I must be three quarters of the way or more through that game you're more than three quarters yeah. of the way like you were in the last 10% of the game and then gave up <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking Joy-Con Drift that's what did it I just couldn't play it anymore and I've subsequently bought a controller and stuff so I should go back and put the effort and maybe once Hollow Knight's done that i'll feel kind of okay about re-entering that world but difficult games man you get addicted to them right <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> yeah i'm hoping i don't get too addicted to just playing difficult games but i think yeah if i've proven to myself something by finally getting around to and beating hollow knight then yeah cuphead is one to definitely go back and see the end credits for certainly i suppose the only other games that i'm thinking about that i want to play from this generation are two games that aren't actually out yet, and that is Cyberpunk and Watch Dogs Legion. Yeah, I, th- I think that Cyberpunk certainly is going to feel like a generation definer, I think, in much the same way that games like The Last of Us or GTA V that came out towards the end of the PS3 generation felt definitive of that console as well. So uh, yeah, I can't wait for those, particularly for, for Cyberpunk. But there's a few other games for me that, that feel like things that I'm sad to miss, and maybe most interestingly of all of those would be Half-Life Alex. It's just a game that, yeah. Neither of us are going to play, basically, unless things change, oh, you know? I, simply put, we don't have the hardware, yeah. and I'm not willing to put the money in to get it. Yeah, and I just think there's probably a lot of games there from this generation, you know, like your Astrobots, Moss, Vader Immortal always looked exciting to me, Beat Saber in VR, that yeah. would just be fantastic to play, but like you say, without wanting to invest that money, if you could just try them first and know that you were okay with VR and, and that there was good experiences coming, that could have been something more definitive of this generation, but yeah, they're they're just not on the backlog because it doesn't feel worth putting them there, even if they a lot of these games, particularly Half-Life, look fucking brilliant, you know? I mean, Half-Life Alex truly looked like the next step in VR, 100%, and I would absolutely have loved to have played that, but I don't have the hardware, and I have really no interest in spending the amount of money that it would require to get the hardware to play it, so yeah, unfortunately that is one that will be sitting on my backlog forever, <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right, I think we'll have to call it a day there, Lewis. Well, that was some of our games that we've missed from this generation. But if you've got any games that you would really have liked to have played in this generation, you should hit us up on social media. I'd be very interested to find out what games people have missed out on or think that they've missed out on from this generation and might never actually get back to playing them. So yeah, let us know on social media. All that fun stuff. And you can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, The Lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it just helps us out so, 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 so much. And while you're over there, if you could leave us a little review as well. Again, it just helps us out so much. And thank you to anyone that's already done that for us. You're an absolute legend to us. I know I say this twice a week, every week. It does not get less important on a weekly basis. So a big thank you to anyone that's done that for us. It genuinely, genuinely does mean a lot. 
I'd like to remind everyone that our play along game for this month is Tacoma. I've still not got around to playing it. I thought that I was going to get to it last week because I thought <laughs> I was going to have finished Bloodborne, but I decided to go for the Platinum like a big dummy. So I've still not played it. But I'm very, very much looking forward to it, Liz. Yeah, I'm much the same space. It'll just have to wait a wee bit longer while I continue to enjoy Hollow Knight. But on one of those frustrating afternoons, maybe that'll be the moment. Nice one, man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.